Good evening. I would like to call to order the Board of Public Works. We have three items on the agenda. The first item is the minutes from our meeting on February 1st. Motion to approve. Second. Any questions or any discussion, any changes? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Item number two, resolution authorizing representative to file applications for financial assistance from the state of Wisconsin Environmental Improvement Fund. Travis, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'll start by a little bit of background of this improvement fund. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the Wisconsin Environmental Improvement Fund <laughs> is a state revolving loan fund that combines federal capitalization grants from the EPA and the Clean Water and Drinking Water State revolving funds with state funding to provide financial assistance to municipalities for public owned drinking water infrastructure projects that are needed to achieve or maintain compliance. That's the keyword compliance with federal and state regulations relating to water supply. In our case, it could potentially be the lead service laterals replacements. Uh, this resolution is one of many parts needed to be established for the improvement fund application process. The resolution will allow the water utility to apply for current and future programs associated with the Wisconsin Environmental Improvement Fund. I am asking and recommending the council to approve this resolution and allow the water utility manager to be the authorized representative to file applications with the Wisconsin Environmental Improvement Funds. Any questions? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any any questions for Travis? I just have one question. It does this um, require an upfront cost? This grant? No. no. Okay. No. Perfect. Thank you. No. All right. If all those are in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Item number three: approved contract 2021-22. ACOMS Schuster Drive Landfill Monitoring. Good evening, Doug. Good evening. Uh, tonight's agenda item is the landfill uh, gas extraction and groundwater monitoring contract. But prior to asking for approval and discussion on that item, um, I, we've asked AECOM representatives Tori Schultz and Leo Littemanston to do a little brief update on the landfill monitoring and the vapor intrusion investigation. Currently underway. I'll get that one started here. Tori and Leo, could you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Tori, um, I'll turn it over to you then. All right, thank you. Uh, Leo Leninston. A colleague of mine is also on the phone calling in to uh, give a brief update on the uh, former Schuster Drive landfill vapor intrusion investigation and uh, landfill monitoring services. Uh, we can go on to slide number two. As you know, uh, we gave a brief update back in June. Uh, this is a similar figure that we've shown here on the right-hand side. Uh, the beginning of this investigation, the samples that were collected for the vapor intrusion began in August of 2019, and we are continuing. Uh, we have collected samples from uh, approximately 190 homes in the neighborhood, uh, and this is in general accordance with the Wisconsin DNR r, &R 800, which is their publication for vapor intrusion investigations. Uh, so. As, as we started this investigation, the city did a wonderful job to, to gather uh, demographic information and provided us with phone numbers to contact these residents. Uh, in doing so, we quickly realized that there was already an existing number of radon mitigation systems in the neighborhood, and that's 24. Uh, that's kind of important to know because the systems that were installed uh, to deal with the vapor intrusion pathway were very similar uh, to a radon mitigation system. Those existing systems in the neighborhood are shown uh, in the, the dark or the black hatch that angles off to the right-hand side. 
in the figure, but then also the homes that we've sampled are shown in green. And then a few homes uh, are shown on this figure, which we were not allowed to uh, sample because access was not granted. Um, in doing this investigation, uh, we also collected 11 outdoor ambient air samples, and those provided a constant uh, to evaluate the other forces acting in the neighborhood. Um, and we collected those samples, they were spread out while we were collecting samples from other homes in the neighborhood. Um, and then we also, uh, in cooperation with the Department of Health, uh, shown on this figure here, two properties in light blue uh, were sampled by the Department of Health. Um, and there was one actually additional property that was sampled um, due to some, some variable variabilities that took place in, uh, in the, the sampling, but also with a resident that was uh, adamant about having the Department of Health that also would do some sampling at their home. But the results of those sampling has shown at those properties that no action was, was required. Um, in the sampling that we conducted, um, in accordance with the DNR guidance document, we were to collect two samples uh, during two different seasons, uh, one in the heating season, which is what we're in now, where we're heating our home, and then one also in the cooling season, uh, the summer months. And the reason we do that is because of the different uh, factors that uh, draw air into the home. Forced air system uh, generally pulls air into the system during the heating season. Uh, and in the cooling season, you have different factors. So the DNR asks that we collect samples during different seasons. Um, on the next bullet here, we have, we have uh, the sampling is scheduled through May of 2021, uh, which is kind of an, a bit of an uncertainty. Uh, and the reason we say that is because uh, when we install a subslab de depressurization system or, or a system is installed, the DNR guidance uh, asks that we collect three per performance verification system uh, sampling events uh, that are to occur in no less than three months. Uh, I'm sorry, in no less than six months. Uh, the last system that was installed, uh, Doug, you can move on to the next slide. The last system uh, was a, the 23rd system that was installed, uh, was installed in November of 2019. So we need to wait another few months before we can get back out and collect our third performance verification event. So as I, as I just touched on, we've installed, there's been 23 systems that have been commissioned, uh, sub-slab depressurization systems. Uh, we refer to them as SSDS for short. Uh, on the figure lower right-hand corner of the screen here, you can see uh, southeast portion of the neighborhood. Uh, we refer to it as the southeast focus area. Um, in that portion of the neighborhood, that is the only portion that sub-slab depressurization systems have been installed. Uh, and we have completed evaluation of 22 of the systems. Uh, and as I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, one of the systems that was just installed uh, in November, we've done two of the performance verification sampling events, and that's during the heating season. So we now we need to wait until the cooling season, um, April, May, uh, as it shows here uh, on the screen. Uh, just recently, we removed the last air purifier from a property. Those air purifiers are deployed uh, intentionally when we see uh, vapor action levels exceeded on a property, and those air purifiers are deployed temporarily until a mitigation system is installed. So just recently, uh, we removed an air purifier from a property, and I use this one particular property as the example on the lower left hand of the screen here in which we had to do additional investigation um, you can see the initial sampling event, uh, April of 2020. The indoor air results uh, show TCE was 6.0. The first and second sampling events, those performance events, uh, one in June and one in September of 2020, were both above the vapor action level for TCE. Um, whenever we see uh, concentrations uh, that are not below the vapor action level, we need to do a little bit more investigation. Um, and this particular property was a little bit more challenging. Um, it was actually the most challenging property that we had in terms of coordinating with the residents. Um, even though they, they allowed a system to be installed in their home uh, and, and allowed us into their home a few times there during the first and second performance events, um, they were very, very much a challenge to get in contact with uh, to continue the investigation as well as the Department of Health was unable to connect with them as well uh, and educate them on the potential other sources that may be in their home that were introduced by the residents. So in short, uh, we get to January of 2021. 
Um, we were able to connect with the residents um, through an actual visit to their home um, when we were out in the neighborhood and they allowed us in and, and it was a very good meeting in which they were, were educated quite a bit and they really understood that they needed to cooperate so that we could continue this investigation and, and collect that third performance event. So we collected the sample uh, in January, results came back as non-detect for uh, TCE. So the, vapor, uh, the indoor air uh, purifier was removed and uh, you can see the results shown on this, this table here on the lower left hand corner. Uh, the data that we have collected on the systems that have installed continue to show that uh, the air concentrations have been re reduced to below the vapor action levels. So the systems that are in are functioning as uh, designed. You can continue on to the next slide. Um, along with these sub-slab depressurization systems that are installed are continuing obligations. Um, during the third performance event, we present the residents with uh, an operation uh, maintenance and monitoring plan, and that plan explains to those residents the com main components of the system and uh, what is required that uh, an annual inspection uh, of that system is required by the DNR. Uh, but during that third performance event, we uh, introduced those residents and actually conducted uh, an inspection and showed them how quickly and easily it was to uh, to do the inspection and then document the inspection. Um, eight of the property owners have uh, agreed to do their own inspection uh, with the remainder of uh, the systems installed will be the responsibility of the city to do those annual inspections going forward. Um, and those annual inspections and the systems that are installed um, are, are permanent until uh, data demonstrates that there is no longer uh, a vapor intrusion uh, potential. So we would have to collect data that demonstrates that uh, there's no reason for uh, a sub-slab depressurization to, any, to exist any longer. Um, so it, it, that's in the uncertainty uh, of where we're at, but continuing obligation, uh, we would expect at this point to be an annual inspection. Um, we've communicated to the residents that we desire that they do their annual inspection in around the spring of the year, and then we've given them a, a tentative de deadline in around June so that we can follow up with them if they are not doing an inspection. Next slide, please. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Leo Linnemanston, who's now going to uh, describe the landfill monitoring services that we do. Thank you, Tori. Uh, good evening, everyone. So. Uh, I'm going to describe to you the, the proposed landfill monitoring services we have for the, the next two years for 2021 through 2022. Uh, they're very similar to the ongoing landfill monitoring services that uh, we've done the past two years and actually uh, and it's been going on the landfill monitoring uh, for pushing 20, 25 years, uh, the continuous monitoring of the, the groundwater and gas systems out at the landfill. Uh, the services here are kind of summarized in that uh, it involves some remote monitoring of the, the operational systems out there. There's, there's an operating landfill gas blower and groundwater extraction system uh, that the combination systems are monitored daily just to make sure that they're up and running. If there's any problems that uh, action can be taken to correct. Uh, the services then include uh, monthly uh, water level monitoring. Uh, this is to check on the performance of the, the extraction system, make sure it's achieving its uh, operational goal, which is, is gradient control, uh, gradient mean trying to prevent the plume from further leaving the, the landfill area. Uh, quarterly landfill gas monitoring, uh, where we go around and check the, the probes around the perimeter of the landfill to make sure that there is no landfill gas migrating away uh, from from the, the property and then also during that same visit we we monitor the gas extraction wells over the top of the the, the hill the cap itself uh, make sure that the system is performing properly that we're drawing the gas out and if we need be we can focus the the vacuum that's applied by the blower where it where it'll do the most most benefit uh, the other parts of the monitoring include then uh, 
quarterly, semi-annual, and annual. Uh, they're kind of tiered uh, monitoring visits where we come out and sample the, the monitoring network out around the landfill. Uh, the quarterly visits are abbreviated visits where we come out and sample a short list of wells. Again, it's to determine the proper performance of the extraction system. Uh, beyond, in addition to the water levels, it shows us that the extraction wells are, are providing that gradient control. The, the water sampling helps us confirm that by providing us some chemical data that we can see the, the constituents in the plume are being held in check. Uh, Semi-annually, then, we also sample some private wells uh, at distance around the landfill, uh, confirming that uh, water is safe to drink. And then uh, annually, we get our snapshot of the entire uh, network of monitoring wells. All the wells are sampled, uh, approximately about uh, 45, I think, in total. And uh, we get our, our snapshot, then, of the entire site uh, on on the property and then extending off site to the north east and south um, as part of the program then uh, uh, each year we generate a landfill gas report uh, su submit to the dnr showing the compliance with uh, the plan modifications and then also uh, at, at two-year intervals we submit a groundwater report that uh, again summarizes all the data that's been collected and provides uh, a demonstration that the systems are operating as intended. Uh, next slide. So what we wanted to highlight is that uh, during the past period, it saw the culmination of uh, a plan modification that was initially started uh, around 2014, 2015, where we sought from the DNR a reduction in uh, the landfill gas system operations. Uh, at that time, we had seen and felt that we had uh, the data to uh, start reducing some of the monitoring and operations of the system. Uh, the changes that were, were enacted were we were able to discontinue the burning of the landfill gas flare, uh, that was almost immediately. Uh, the landfill itself is is very, oh, it's it's in its tail end of its its life as far as a land as a methane producer. And so the it was no longer producing sufficient gas to support combustion of the flare. So that was petitioned for and discontinued. Likewise, uh, we were then further able to, over the next couple of years, demonstrate that uh, the control of landfill gas could be done with reduced operation of the blower, uh, further saving money and reduce the, the amount of electricity they use to run the blower system because we run on an intermittent schedule. And then as we continue to demonstrate with through the data collection, uh, we were able to reduce the, the monitoring at the perimeter wells. Uh, at the start of this, we were making weekly visits, uh, and now we've reduced it all the way to where it's a quarterly monitoring event. So we're only out there every three months to collect uh, gas readings. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're looking forward now in, in, in the groundwater portion of the monitoring that uh, as the vapor intrusion investigation has completed its, its vapor phase, uh, the in-home sampling, sub-slab sampling, that uh, there will be some additional groundwater investigation in the subdivision uh, as part of that to f nail down the, the monitoring, the long-term monitoring of the plume out beneath the subdivision. Once that's completed, those wells uh, will, like, will be incorporated into the, the landfill monitoring program and be part of the, the ongoing monitoring. What the figure here uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the slide shows is uh, the water table contours showing the landfill in pink in the northwest corner there, and then groundwater flow away from it uh, to the east and southeast from the landfill. Uh, of note here 
is that uh, you can clearly see the effect that our groundwater extraction system has in attempting to control the plume uh, by the, the closed depression just on the south end of the landfill. Uh, that, that little bullseye there is the result of our extraction of groundwater there, uh, preventing or reducing the migration of the plume away from the landfill. We have a pair of wells there, and there's another pair of extraction wells uh, that work up on the north end of the landfill. T together in uh, 2020, we pumped about 20 million gallons of water from the ground there in trying to, or in, in complying with the, the gradient control requirement. Our monitoring services that include uh, the, again, the checking on that system daily, uh, the reporting of all the monitoring data that's collected, uh, demonstrating its performance. Uh, a couple of bullet points here, point out some of the historical uh, highlights. Uh, the groundwater system was started in the late 90s uh, and it's been in continuous operation since then with a few interruptions for, for modifications or, or service uh, maintenance type shutdowns. Um, it will need to continue operating into the foreseeable future as we want to continue controlling the groundwater plume and prevent further migration beneath the, the subdivision. Uh, most of the reductions that we saw in the VOCs from the operation occurred in the, the first five years, looking through the historical data, and then probably over the last five years, uh, we still track it continuously but the, the concentrations, the levels of contamination that we see have pretty much st our steady state now. They're, they're at a lower level, but they, they're no longer declining. They're, they're pretty much holding steady. Um, next slide, please. So what I just described to you was the, the landfill gas and groundwater monitoring services uh, that we're looking for uh, continuing for the next two years. Um, the, as Tori explained in the first part of this uh, presentation, uh, the ongoing vapor intrusion investigation uh, is, is the, the vapor phase is winding down the, the in-home testing and the installation of, of uh, the SSDS systems. But we still need to complete uh, the groundwater portion of that um, and what we're, we're looking forward to is that uh, as that investigation unfolds, it will be incorporating that along with a, a plan modification for the landfill itself. Uh, similar in, in uh, purpose as the landfill gas uh, plan mod was several years ago, we'll be looking to modernize the monitoring network at the landfill. Uh, what that would entail is that uh, looking through the many, many years of data and, and the history, we will be proposing to uh, eliminate, uh, abandon uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 monitoring wells, uh, some of which are, are over 30 years old uh, that we've been on and off monitoring uh, through the, the requirements of the DNR. Uh, but part of that will be, we'll also be incorporating, we're figuring uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 new wells that will become part of that network. Um, basically, we'll be getting rid of then some of these older wells that are no longer needed and adding wells that are uh, better positioned to help us understand and keep track of the plume beneath the subdivision and uh, provide us data for the landfill, as I'm suggesting here in the next bullet there for uh, the foreseeable future, and and right now I won't venture a guess of it being any less than ten years, uh, knowing the history of this landfill and the the type of plume we're dealing with. It may be a longer period, but it's it's needed. Uh, the last bullet point here is that we do continue to seek out ways to to try to be efficient out there and keep the costs manageable. Um, I know that over the years there's been occasionally some thoughts of uh, opportunities to, to do some renewable energy type project. Um, it is a large space on a, on a high point up on the hill. Uh, some of these things may be viable, um, but uh, any of these could be explored further. 
uh, but they would have to keep in mind uh, some of the basic premises of the, the, the landfills systems up there, meaning uh, protection of its cap and, and preservation of its, its uh, uh, remedial systems, landfill gas and, and groundwater systems. Uh, next slide. And lastly, just kind of big picture, um, want to mention that uh, in the past year, in 2020, that uh, the DNR uh, with the Department of Health, Health uh, looked to establish uh, some changes to the statewide groundwater standards uh, and also inc incorporate some new standards, uh, specifically with uh, interest to the landfill. We were looking that uh, the Department of Natural Resources will be lowering the groundwater standard for trichloroethylene, which is one of the uh, primary contaminants coming out of the, the landfill in its plume. It was also the driver for the, the vapor intrusion uh, investigation. Uh, the TCE standard will be lowered from its current uh, enforcement standard of five micrograms per liter uh, by an entire order of magnitude by a power of 10. It'll be lowered down to 0.5. Um, this will have an effect of, of one, making it uh, harder to achieve um, getting below that number. It's, it's, it will take a longer time. Uh, it also would expand potentially the area that uh, would be in exceedance. Um, so that's significant here, just uh, not so much in that our investigations haven't been thorough. We've, we've been very thorough and, and have definition of our, of our extent, but it's, it's more in speaking to the, the length of time that might be required to achieve the lower standard. Uh, the other thing that was proposed in the last year uh, is that there are going to be promulgating uh, numeric standards for PFAS compounds uh, in the coming year or two, uh, see how fast they get through the process. Um, PFAS is, is a, a new class of contaminants. I guess it's not so new, but it's, it's come to very much prominence in the past year. Uh, the DNR in December uh, gave to the governor their uh, plan forward on, on PFAS and we're anticipating that it's possible sometime in the next year or two that uh, we'll be asked to investigate for the, the presence of those compounds at the landfill too. Uh, at this point, we don't know that, but we're, we're anticipating that that's possibly in the offing. So that's it for my presentation. I guess I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Leo. All right, thank you, Leo. Tori, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, Alderman Allen. Uh, the ongoing inspections, will those be performed by, they're the city responsibility, will those be performed by city personnel or is that part of what we're contracting out? The ones that choose, the homeowners that choose not to do a self-inspection will be done by city staff. Okay. And there was a mention of removal of, I believe, 20 million gallons of water through pumping. Where, where does that get disposed of? Uh, that goes into our sanitary sewer and gets treated at our treatment plant. Okay. And then final question is uh, the homeowners that declined any inspection at all, there were a number of those. Is there any city exposure in the future if those people choose to sue or claim harm? Or have we? I mean, there's active litigation, so we, I mean, can't really talk about it at this point. Okay. Thank you. All right. Are there anybody? Oh, Alderman. <clears throat> Yeah, I just dug. Um, are we going to plan to schedule like a, a Zoom meeting even or something to kind of update all these property owners in Villa Park? I know 
with COVID, some of our meetings got pushed and we were trying to do it. I just, just to kind of give them the same presentation we just got um, or updates kind of explaining uh, where we're kind of at. Um, you know, everybody should, everybody that needed to be contacted was contacted, um, you know, I guess I just want to make sure that everyone in Villa Park feels good understanding where the city's at. I would say that would be appropriate when we get closer to the end of the investigation with uh, uh, the testing in the spring. So maybe after, okay. after that point. So like a spring uh, kind of meeting maybe would be Yeah, good. and that's something, okay. you know, I'll discuss with Jay and, and we can. Okay, perfect. the timing of that we we did do a kickoff meeting in October of 19 and then had another uh, zoom June ish I want to say of 2020 uh, last year so so timing wise I don't know if spring is if we'll be that much further by then versus June of 2021 but I guess I just put to manage expectations would we'll keep you posted as to when it occurs but we'll do it when the when it makes sense that we have the, the best information available and Tori and Leo um, and city staff meet with the Wisconsin DNR on a regular basis to keep them apprised of the progress that we're making. So we, we also work with the DNR as to the, the best timing to share that information back out to the constituents. But appropriate recommendation to do it at the close of, I feel like we did it, we'll have done it at the beginning, middle, and then hopefully a wrap up of the right that's what i'm saying analysis. like yeah i'd like to have at least some sort of a wrap up and obviously we're, we know it's going to be an ongoing issue like they said for 10 years but at least you know we can put to rest hopefully the majority of people less the lawsuit etc but anyone else okay do you have a motion motion, motion approve. to approve oh, second. second okay we have motion all those in favor Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carried. Thank you, Tori. Being no f further business before the Board of Public Works, I adjourn. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. And good evening. I will call to order the City of West Bend Common Council meeting for February 15th, 2021. Hopefully everybody had a wonderful uh, Valentine's Day yesterday. I'll note that all the aldermen are present and accounted for, so please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I'll note that we have nine items on our agenda. The first being presentations. Number one, Police Department Citizen Appreciation Awards with a presentation by our police chief, Chief Moyler. Good evening. Um, tonight, uh, we're announcing award recipients, 30 citizens. Uh, as you know, in the past, we'd have them all here at the meeting and give presentations because of present uh, restrictions. Um, we are instead having officers deliver these awards to the citizens in the community or having them come to the police department to receive. Um, we will be posting the names and summaries uh, tomorrow morning along with some of the pictures that we have already um, served the uh, or awarded the recipients. I'll just tell you briefly uh, the recipients, uh, four of them, Robert Kuklinski, Jeffrey Luttrell, Tanner Welch and Rob Steiner uh, receiving awards for their information that they gave last August in apprehending a bank robbery suspect. Uh, shortly after photos were posted of that individual, Robert Kuklinski uh, called that he uh, identified the suspect and shortly thereafter, uh, working with individuals in the community, uh, we were able to track him down um, and the last person that's mentioned here, Rob Steiner, actually followed the suspect from a gas station, alerted police to his whereabouts, and he was safely apprehended later that same day. So thank all of those individuals. Uh, two individuals, uh, Karen Elliott and Harry Shehorn, are being um, given awards last August 28th. Um, they observed a fire uh, at a neighbor's residence. Um, 
the residents, a mother and three children, were safely uh, evacuated due to their quick action. Firefighters were able to put out the fire safely. Um, Eric Kelly, um, October, observed an individual um, stealing a large amount of merchandise from the Walmart, followed the individual out, uh, gave descriptions, called police. Due to his actions, we were able to make a quick arrest and uh, return several thousand dollars in merchandise to the store. Uh, Michael Janty on December 23rd um, was shopping um, at the Home Depot when he observed a off-duty police officer struggling with an individual. Uh, Mr. Janty came, came to the officer's assistance, uh, assisted the officer taking the man into custody and waiting for police to arrive um, due to his actions, saved possible injury to the officer and uh, safely brought the man into custody for a felony retail theft. Uh, Julie Trunley is being uh, awarded um, just this last, earlier this month, she observed a police uh, foot chase, saw an individual hide objects uh, in a snowbank, uh, which was some um, illegal drugs. Um, she gave information not only to where the suspect was, but uh, to identify this property. Um, we had another incident earlier this month where a citizen, uh, an officer was taking a woman into custody. She began fighting with the officer. The citizen came out, uh, John P. Daly, I'm sorry, I forgot to give his name, um, assisted uh, in getting extra officers into the building uh, to uh, aid the officer that was struggling and fortunately neither the officer nor the suspect were injured. And uh, then this last Friday night uh, or Friday, Thursday night, Friday morning at four o'clock in the morning, in fact this worker I just talked to his boss, didn't even know that he had done this, David Gerke who works for the city of West Bend as a snow driver, snow plow driver, um, Four o'clock in the morning, saw a five-year-old child out in uh, nothing but his pajamas on. It was minus five degrees at the time. Um, no question that if Mr. Gerke didn't take the actions he took, that that little boy tragically probably would not have made it. Uh, Mr. Gerke got the boy into his truck, notified police, and uh, police found that the boy had woken up during the night and left the residents without uh, care. Um, people that were responsible for him realizing he had left. Uh, and as I mentioned, I talked to his boss earlier tonight and he wasn't even aware of it. So Doug, thank you for making sure and we'll be coming out to give David his award. And then 19 people uh, will be getting awards for calling police throughout the year uh, that led to arrest of a number of impaired drivers throughout the city and uh, each one of those times uh, uh, people either called us as they were following people, gave uh, descriptions, some people took videos of the drivers, all led to the arrest of 19 individuals for operating while impaired and taking dangerous people off the road. So thank you to those 30 citizens and uh, we look forward to next year having a live event again. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thanks for sharing the stories. We'll move on to item number two, approval of the Common Council regular minutes for February 1st. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you, Allen and Model. Any questions or corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor, sit by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm. Thank you. Move on to consent agenda consisting of items three and four. Second. Thank you. Uh, Kaler and Alan. Any questions on those? I just have one question. I just want to make sure with Doug that he feels good, uh, like satisfied with AECOM, feeling good about the response time, uh, follow ups with your staff and everything if we go with them. Um, I absolutely do have the utmost confidence in their professionalism and how they handled this uh, delicate investigation. Um, 
we have uh, the question came up from the mayor earlier um, today um, we have gone out to RFP in the past as recent as the last contract and every time history has shown that AECOM comes in at the lowest price and has a long history with the city which is very beneficial as well great thank you I just wanted to make sure you guys felt good and sure, <laughs> everything absolutely. Was going on. okay good thanks Doc. thank you any other questions Seeing none, all those in favor of consenting the agenda, said by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We have one agenda item for consideration. That's number five, mayoral appointment of David Etmer to the Police and Fire Commission. We did have a resignation on that commission. Uh, I got to talk to Dave a little while. He's a good guy, Worked with works with Family Promise. Uh, he has worked with Family Promise for quite a while, past uh, president of our chamber. VP and director of West Bend Mutual. He just really likes getting involved. So thank you for stepping up once again. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you, Burquist and Allen. <clears throat> Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, and thank you, sir, for stepping up. And then we'll move on to reports. And we'll take item six, seven, and eight all together. They're all reports by Alderman Model. Uh, they are regarding the downtown bid board meeting, the community TV committee meeting, and the historic Barton Business Association. Take it away. Thank you, Mary Jenkins. Um, first of all, let's start with the, uh, the bid board. We had a meeting on February 2nd, 8.15 a.m. right here in the City Hall Council Chambers. Um, very brief financial report. Um, we're only a couple of months in, so we didn't have much to talk about there. We did discuss, you probably have noticed uh, walking or driving through downtown that some of the, the roof line lights are out. Um, we've discussed uh, having those looked at and possibly a quote to having that fixed. So Rob Steiner will be attending the March or are we doing April, right? We'll do an update in the next meeting. Okay, yeah, update in the next meeting, very good. Um, we uh, revisited the bid board committees um, and discussed the transportation committee and marketing committee. The transportation committee will continue in 2021 with the existing members. The marketing committee will start anew, beginning with a small group from the bid board, including Kathleen Murphy, Peg Fisher, myself, and Ken Collins. All right, moving on to the community TV report um jess wiles reported on the communications department projects um programs and social media growth and implement implementation of the new video on demand nicole bell offered uh, last quarter numbers we saw 17,018 on the cv ctv facebook page instagram a uh, seven percent increase uh twitter uh i'm sorry Yes, Twitter 1% increase and LinkedIn 4.3% increase. Um, John Alkey, our production manager, continues to be up to the challenge of keeping our virtual options open and live streaming West Bend High School sporting events, holiday events, such as the Christmas parade and tree lighting ceremony. On YouTube, we, enjoy, we continue to enjoy an international audience as well as local, of course. And finally, Jess gave us another brief financial report. Um, finally, the HBBA report. First, let's talk about what happened over the past year, some of the good stuff anyways. Due to the pandemic, we did not get to do much for events, but we did continue to meet at Sandy's and discuss the building of the garden and continue to purchase Christmas stuff and make plans as we could. We did get the cornerstone for the garden designed, purchased, and placed in Barton Garden and planning to purchase a memorial bench in the name of Mason Holbrook. Our thoughts and prayers to the Holbrook family and all affected by his passing. He is truly one of Barton's little angels. Speaking of angels, we also held a birthday party for Clara Malls, who turned 110 years old this past December 19th. An enthusiastic thank you to the Malls family for their donation in the amount of $1,500. Wow. Next, we got involved with what is now called the Historic Barton Fishery at Eddie's Lake House on Wallace Lake. A huge thank you to Sandy and Eddie and Kim and the crew for all their hard work in making that event such a great success. I believe we will, doing that. we will be doing that winter event going forward. So looking at the future, the voting members have decided to hire an accountant to keep our finances straight and do our taxes. We had uh, been handling it in-house and volunteers, but it is too much. Thank you for Tammy, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do that. Speaking of that, we got a quote for the lighting of the dam and getting pretty darn close to our goal for that, hoping this summer. Like I said earlier, memorial bench for Mason for the garden, but also a group talking about purchasing an additional bench to complete the seating plans for that garden. 
also have a couple of really nice outdoor sculpture that should complete the basic structure of the garden. Um, next thing. Uh, speaking of sculpture, we owe a uh, debt of gratitude to the Friends of Sculpture group who are planning to move the tilted donut sculpture to the Firefighter Memorial Bluff in front of West Bend Company. It is uh, not enjoying much of an audience where it is. It's a big, beautiful, abstract, industrial metal sculpture that will be showcased at the bluff as you enter or exit Barton. Um, and I think that's about it. Yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff going on, but as it as it comes up, we'll uh, we'll talk more about that. That's it. Sounds good. Lots of good stuff going on. Yeah. Any questions for Alderman Model? Seeing none, we'll go to number nine. A report by Alderman Butchlick or Dolnick regarding the Planning Commission meeting. Planning Commission um, had a short agenda. Uh, most of it having to do with the development of a cold storage facility on uh, University Drive north of Decorah Road. Um, but we did set the public hearing for TIF number 15, which is the brewery project. Um, and that, so that will be next month. And I believe we might also have the site plan as well for it. Uh, other things uh, on the horizon are coming up. It sounds like March and April will, and that's usually the way it is with plan commission because as we get into spring, um, things start happening. So March and April look like it'll be exciting times for the plan commission. Just in time for Alderman Butchlick to get his feet wet. <laughs> Sounds good. Any questions for Alderman Dolnick? Uh, seeing none, it does complete our agenda. I'll open up if there's any announcements, but I'll first just remind the public we do have a primary election tomorrow for the state DPI and our own district two. If you vote at the library, uh, don't forget to vote tomorrow. Any other announcements for the good of the order? Yes, sir. Uh, happy Fat Tuesday, everybody. <laughs> Tomorrow, it's garbage day. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Anything else? If not, having no further business for the Common Council, I will adjourn by the call of the chair. Have a great night.